Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? All right. Uh, very excited uh, to be here, uh, so I can tell you everything you always wanted to know, but you were always afraid to ask about Shufflekey, who's a joint worker with uh, Elia Anzuoni. Um, so just in a nutshell, just giving you the short version of uh, what I'm talking about, Shufflekey is a plausible deniability system uh, uh, for Linux. Uh, the idea is to hide the existence of uh, hidden partitions uh, within your hard drive or your um, uh, your SSD, um, in such a way that it's not 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 possible even forensically to prove that these partitions exist without the right password. So the idea is to improve. If you are familiar with TrueCrypt or VeraCrypt, these were uh, pretty popular uh, software back in the time. Nowadays, a bit less, but uh, they are still used. And um, uh, ShuffleCake is based on similar ideas, but improves on many aspects. So first of all, uh, it has some uh, stronger uh, foundations, including a cryptographic, a formal cryptographic proof of security. Um, it improves uh, operational security over TrueCrypt. Uh, it is faster than ORAM-based solution. That is another approach to obtaining uh, hidden file systems on your on your laptop. Uh, it's uh, free software, like free as in freedom. It's released uh, under uh, GPL v2 or superior. And uh, as we will see, it has the potential to improve the security even faster. So the idea is that it's an attractive middle ground between uh, the efficiency but low security of TrueCrypt and the uh, high security but uh, bad performance of ORAM-based solution. So uh, how cool is ShuffleCake? Well, uh, so far we had uh, pretty good feedback about it. We presented it last year at uh, DEF CON Demo Labs in, uh, in Vegas. Uh, we published uh, an academic paper at CCS. We ended up uh, on uh, Slashdot, uh, Hacker News. Uh, so, I mean, the feedback was good. Now what we are trying to do is to build a, a, a larger community of contribution. So, uh, first of all, a uh, few words about me. Uh, my last name is Gagliardoni, by the way. That's the difficult part. Um, I am a, I'm a cryptographer and mathematician. Uh, I did my PhD in, um, uh, in Germany. I work at IBM, and then I joined the research team at uh, Kudelski Security, which is a, a Swiss-American cybersecurity company, not to be confused with Kaspersky Security. I don't do antivirus. So uh, my focus is on cryptography, especially on the privacy and uh, quantum computing side. This is just to say that at any point in time, you can find me somehow in a quantum superposition of a more business or less business activity. And shuffle kick definitely goes in the less business activity. Okay, so there is nothing commercial here. It's just a, a pet project of uh, Elia and myself at this point. All right, so this is what we are going to see. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an introduction to the problem, what plausible deniability aims to solve, what are the past solutions, in particular TrueCrypt and Orams, and then I'm going to explain you how ShuffleCake improves over this situation, and uh, we will finish with some future direction because there is a lot of uh, space for uh, improvement. All right, so uh, I guess it starts with... Uh, your local storage. So in an, in an age where, uh, you know, more and more data is delegated to the cloud, uh, you can see your local storage as the, somehow the, the ultimate bastion of privacy in the sense that you want to keep your most secret assets uh, local, possibly as much as you can. And of course, uh, you want to protect this data. So the usual approach is to encrypt the data with full disk encryption solutions. There is a lot of uh, uh, well-established solution for this that are quite widespread. You are probably using it even if you don't know it. Uh, there is BitLocker, FileVault, Lux. So, and uh, now this, of course, brings the usual problem because I guess most of you are familiar with this, uh, with this comic, right? I mean, how much does this protect uh, the real, uh, the, the end user in the real world. Because one thing is, there is a burglar who steals your laptop and takes it away, that's fine. Another thing is, you are interrogated and you are forced to reveal uh, your password with uh, l less pleasant methods, let's say. And uh, this pleasant method can be, I mean, it's, it's not necessary to have the $5 range, uh, which nowadays should be probably a $50 because of inflation, right? But, uh, <laughs> 
it's also the problem that uh, there is many different uh, scenarios where the out, I mean, the, your adversary, your coercive adversary has some additional power on you. It can be uh, violence, but it can be legal threats. Uh, there is many cases where, uh, uh, you know, not giving the password is not really an option. And you might think, okay, but uh, I mean, is how much paranoia is there, right? I mean, is this uh, real things that happen or it's more like a, a beer talk? Well, um, unfortunately, if you look uh, at what happens in the real world, we have plenty, plenty of reports where, uh, for example, the legal, uh, the, the, the legal protections, the legal systems that, um, um, or let's say legal ways that allow the police to force you to disclose a password in serious cases of terrorism or similar, they have been abused pretty badly. And uh, even worse, uh, most of the reports that we know in this respect, they all come from uh, uh, Western countries, so places where if these things happen, eventually the press will know. Uh, we don't know anything about what's happening in uh, uh, less democratic countries, uh, and uh, the situation might be even worse than that. In fact, uh, the main use cases for this tool is not terrorist or stuff, as you can think, but uh, uh, we have a lot of use cases for journalists, for example. Investigative journalists in low democracy countries, they are always, uh, I mean, the authorities know that they are journalists, they are going to interrogate them, they are going to stop them at the border, they are going to confiscate their electronics. Um, we had, I, I had a discussion with some officer from the Red Cross they say, look, we have the same problem, you know, our uh, operators, uh, they travel, they cross borders with laptops full of very sensitive stuff. In theory, we are protected by the, you know, international agreement, we are an uh, international body, whatever, but go to explain it at the angry guard at the Afghan border who ask you, give me your password, say, no, no, I am Red Cross not going to work. So anyway, uh, there is real use cases for this. It's not just paranoia. So how do you tackle this problem that requires more than encryption? Well, the first solution who aimed at solving this problem was TrueCrypt. Uh, TrueCrypt used to be a very uh, popular um, um, disk encryption tool. Uh, the main use of, the initial use of TrueCrypt was full disk encryption because this was in an age where full disk encryption was not widespread like today. So if you wanted to do full disk encryption of Windows, uh, you had to use TrueCrypt. But later it evolved to support uh, something more, as we will see. And uh, now, this software was extremely shady. Okay, it had a troubled history, uh, things didn't really fit well. It was replaced, uh, um, after the discontinuation, it was replaced by VeraCrypt, which is a much more open, much more uh, transparent and mature uh, software that is still in use nowadays, but uh, it has the same uh, uh, blueprint. The, the, this, from the technical point of view, that's the same solution. So in this talk, whenever I talk about TrueCrypt, you can uh, swap it with VeraCrypt in your mind because all the technical things that I'm going to say apply to both. Uh, also, uh, look, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to make a movie about this guy here because it's a, so this was the suspected author of TrueCrypt. I think he's serving now in federal prison. And uh, it's a little bit between, you know, Mr. Robot and Breaking Bad, kind of. <laughs> and uh, there's people who think he's Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, but, I mean, look, 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 for, look out for the story because it's pretty fun. So, anyway, uh, how does TrueCrypt work? TrueCrypt and VeraCrypt. So the idea is like in most uh, full disk encryption. So, okay, it can work in two ways, in two modes. In the normal mode, this is pretty much full disk encryption. So uh, you have a key, like a password-derived key that encrypts uh, your, uh, your data in, a, in your file system, for example, a FAT16 file system. And then you have the empty space after your data. Now, the difference between uh, other solutions like Lux uh, is that uh, if you don't have this password, everything, so you don't have clear text headers. The first thing uh, uh, TrueCrypt does when you initialize a drive is to overwrite it with uh, random bits. And uh, there is no clear text header, so if you don't have the password, the TrueCrypt uh, disk looks like uh, full of garbage. 
uh, unlike LUX or other um, systems where you, you see that there is a header and that tells you that it's an um, encrypted disk. But TrueCrypt can also work in a different way in the plausible deniability mode. The plausible deniability mode, you have one decoy password that unlocks uh, your uh, FAT uh, file system, but you have a second password, the real password, that unlocks another volume that is embedded inside the empty space uh, left by the file system. So you can unlock your laptop with one password or with the second password. And the plausible deniability mechanism comes from the fact uh, that if you don't have the second password, the two scenarios are indistinguishable to the adversary. So the idea is that you can lie to the adversary. They ask you, give me your password. You only give the decoy data. You have your cat pictures here. And uh, your Panama papers are in the hidden uh, partition. That, that's the theory. Now, as I said, the main use cases for this, it's uh, for uh, people who are in constant danger of uh, coercive uh, interrogation. Can be legal pressure, can be social pressure, can be uh, violence. But yeah, things of activists, investigative journalists, whistleblowers. So this, these people really have a threat model that is different from yours. All right. That said, TrueCrypt comes with problems. And these problems were there since the beginning and uh, they are still nowadays unaddressed. First of all, uh, TrueCrypt is single snapshot secure. What does it mean? I'm, I can answer more questions about it later, but basically the idea is that if the adversary uh, get your decoy data, so you asks you for your password, you give him the decoy password, so he gets a snapshot of your disk. And if the adversary can do it at many different points in time, this can leak the information that uh, you have some hidden data that you didn't reveal. And the idea is that if the empty space changes between the snapshot, that doesn't sound right because um, there shouldn't be any data which changes over time. So gives away the presence of hidden data. Uh, another big problem is the container, so your uh, decoy volume, must be a FAT file system. And the reason is that unlike other more modern file systems, the FAT file system is the only one which grows uh, incrementally. So uh, because you need this big chunk of empty space after, after your decoy data in order to embed uh, a volume. The other big problem is that you only have two layers of secrecy. I mean, you have the decoy password and the hidden password. And the adversary sees that you are using TrueCrypt. Why are you using TrueCrypt instead of BitLocker, Lux, whatever? The only plausible reason is that you are using the hidden feature of TrueCrypt. So they are not going to ask you one password. They are going to ask you two passwords, and they are not going to be happy with one password. And at this point, be before we progress with the talk, I want immediately to uh, uh, debunk some um, objections that people usually have when I point out that this problem of TrueCrypt. Some of these objections might make a bit of sense, uh, others uh, no, and I don't want to discuss them because I think it's a waste of time. So objection number one, but TrueCrypt is dead. Why are you talking about TrueCrypt? Everyone is using VeraCrypt nowadays. Yes, but as I said, uh, from the technical point of view, it's the same, okay? So w whatever I'm telling about TrueCrypt also applies to VeraCrypt for, for the sake of this talk. And then there is this less uh, reasonable uh, things like, oh, yes, but, you know, FAT, uh, I still use a FAT file system on my laptop. And, oh, yes, I use VeraCrypt, but I swear to God I don't have anything hidden. I only use it for the full disk encryption feature. You know, it's nothing hidden that I have. Uh, yes, you can also do, actually, plausible deniability with LUX. The only thing you have to do is to do this super complicated uh, wizardry thing that it never really works, but gives you kind of the impression that you're doing something cool. No. Okay, I don't want to discuss about these things, so uh, let's move further. Okay, let's talk about the problem of multi-snapshot security. Uh, as I said, if your adversary asks you for the password, you reveal the decoy data and you have some empty space, apparently empty space. Uh, if the adversary, so the, the, the problem happens with the modern solid state drives. Because in modern solid-state drives, but also USB keys or whatever, there is this uh, 
uh, trim function and uh, things. Uh, in a nutshell, it means that uh, uh, when you delete or change data from uh, from this space, the data is not immediately removed, but it's marked as unused for some time. So there is a, a window of time where you can get uh, in a single physical snapshot, you can get snapshot, logical snapshot of the content at different points in time. And if the adversary sees that this content is changing over time, that doesn't look good for you because it's pretty much uh, a proof that you're hiding something. Now, multi-snapshot security is the property of a plausible deniability system to defend even against uh, this threat model. Now, this threat model is extremely powerful. This multi-snapshot attack are, uh, you, you know, are a thorn on, your, on the side of plausible deniability. They have been known for some time and they, have, they are extremely difficult to mitigate. Now, whether they are really um, possible in the real world or not, uh, uh, we don't know, or at least I cannot tell you, because all the, uh, all the, demonstra all the proofs that I know of, multi-snapshot uh, attacks uh, revealing hidden data are uh, um, under lab conditions uh, or on academic papers, you know, and uh, there is no real world example where somebody went to jail because the police found a hidden volume because of multi-snapshot attack. On the other hand, we have many documented cases in, uh, in past history where even a simple system like TrueCrypt was enough to grant the acquittal of a suspect. So the police or whatever didn't manage to prove uh, in, a, in a court in a, that, that the hidden data was there. So whether they are possible, they are very powerful, these attacks, but whether they are possible or not, this I don't know. In any case, there is a way to protect against this attack. And this attack are called, this way is, is um, they are called ORAMs, Oblivious Random Access Machines. These are uh, very complex cryptographic schemes uh, that they have been shown to work. They are extremely secure. In fact, we have uh, proofs of, uh, formal proofs of security that they work, but the problem is that they are ridiculously slow. In fact, uh, you can use them for a very small database, maybe, but not to hide uh, a large partition on your hard drive. That would be too slow. Now, recently there was, uh, recently, like now is more or less 10 years ago, but uh, there, uh, there was some breakthrough in this research with write-only ORAMs. So write-only ORAM, First of all, it's a very active area of research. There is, uh, you know, new schemes are proposed uh, every, every year. And uh, they are a type of ORAM that only hides write requests, but does not hide the read requests. And they are faster than pure ORAMs, but they are still horribly inefficient. I mean, uh, we are talking about slowdowns of input output of 200 pair of or 75% uh, waste of space. They are still better than full ORAMs, but they are still not really practical for our use case. Plus, the, 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 the reason why write only ORAMs are useful for our case is that uh, they rely on the assumption that read operation that, that do not change the disk state. And now we can start asking some questions. So I, this is the state of the art, and then let's ask some questions. Can we do better? So first of all, these write-only ORAMs, are, are they really secure? I mean, is it, is it worth to pay this price to have full resistance against the multi-snapshot security? First of all, as I told you, multi-snapshot attacks, it's not clear whether they are a threat or not. But most importantly, I mean, Nowadays, you know, the, the devices you are, you're deploying the solution to are extremely complicated. Like if you look at a firmware of a typical SSD drive, I mean, that's a mess. So how can you be sure that uh, read operations do not change the state of the disk? In my opinion, that's a very strong assumption. 
because you don't have any guarantee that here there is not an undocumented area of memory that caches all the requests that you do, maybe not as a backdoor, maybe just for optimization or for um, branch prediction, whatever. So the assumption that makes Warham interesting, that is, read operations do not change the state of the disk, to me, it's a little bit strong. So in order to be 100% secure, you would need ORAMs, but they are too slow. So, but how about uh, practical or legal security? Do we really need 100% uh, um, cryptographic protection? So what if I give you a system where the adversary can uh, detect if you have hidden data with 1%, uh, 2% probability of guessing? From a cryptographic point of view, that's a catastrophic attack. But from a legal point of view, will this, will this be a problem? Let's say that you go to court and, uh, you know, the, the, the public, uh, the, 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 the judge tells you, you know, our forensic expert analyzed your drive and uh, they think uh, with two over three probability that you are hiding some stuff there. I mean, your, your uh, defense lawyer will open up popcorn and say, okay, that's fine, right? I mean, <laughs> you're not going to jail for this. And of course, if you are kidnapped by the cartel, I mean, you're dead anyway. So that's, that, that's another, <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you, you don't worry about this, right? And finally, how about operational security? I mean, do we really need this limitation on the file system type uh, or the number of layers? Uh, because those are real big drawbacks. Welcome to ShuffleKick. Okay, what we did with ShuffleKick is we designed a new system that, uh, I mean, works native for Linux. It's file system agnostic, so you can use whatever file system you want, both for the hidden and the decoy system. You can have many nested volumes. Sorry, I spoiled the... Uh, you can have many nested volumes, so not only two, but you can have up to a certain number of layers. Uh, you put one password, and this password opens at the same time all the volumes that you have that you can use concurrently, unlike TrueCrypt, where if you write data on the decoy file system, then you risk of corrupting the, the hidden data. And uh, it's free software. It's been released under GPL v2 or superior because we want to be pure, of course. And, uh, okay, the way it works, uh, the operating principle of ShuffleCake is one device. By device, I mean block device. So a USB stick, a hard drive, whatever. Uh, even, even a virtual block device. Uh, this is multiplexed into multiple volumes, which are virtual block devices that are encrypted. Uh, every volume is protected by a password. For now, we use passwords. Uh, I mean, in future, we can think of uh, moving to something else, but uh, the, the, for plausible deniability, you still need something that the user has to remember. And uh, all these volumes are um, ordered into a hierarchy. So from the less secret, the decoy one, the cat pictures, to the most secret. So you can have layer zero with the cat pictures. No, I don't believe you. Give me the password. Okay, here is the password. Layer one, pirate mp3. No, I don't believe you. Give me the password. Ah, oh, my mom is going to be so mad at me. Here is the password. Layer two, uh, adult movies. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, at, at some point, uh, you're going to have your... Uh, final hidden volume with the Panama Papers or whatever. So uh, from the cryptography point of view, that's uh, a much stronger foundation than TrueCrypt. I mean, we use well-established schemes, uh, including a very strong key derivation function that is resistant to brute forcing. And moreover, we have a cryptographic security proof, so really a mathematical proof that says that these systems achieves single snapshot security. Uh, the way it works, I don't want to go too much in the details, but I have some time, so if you have questions, you ask me. I mean, there is uh, your volume, there is a, an encrypted header section and a, an encrypted data section. And uh, the encrypted header section provides uh, um, uh, data, uh, provides subheaders for every volume that you want to have. All this is uh, indistinguishable from random data without at least one password, okay? So uh, there is no distinction uh, between encrypted uh, data and the uh, header section without the, um, at least one password. 
Um, the header size is not that big. I mean, it's um, a reasonable size. You can ignore it, basically. The data section, it's divided into slices. Every slice is one megabyte, and every slice can be unallocated or can be allocated to one of the logical volumes, uh, and the positions, they are scrambled at random spots in the, in the data sections. This, the position of um, the mapping between a slice and the position in the logical volume, it's uh, uh, embedded in these encrypted position maps that are in the header. And the size uh, is kept under control by fine-tuning the, uh, the parameters, basically. Every uh, slice is made, uh, is, um, uh, there is encrypted data, and there is initialization vectors for this encrypted data. In fact, uh, we are using currently, in the current version of ShuffleCake, uh, we are using ASCTR instead of ASXTS, that is the most common way of, encrypted, of encrypting for full disk encryption. But there is a reason for this, because we want we plan of adding a feature in the future uh, that uses this property of ASCTR of doing a re-randomization. In other words, what we want is an encryption system where uh, you can change this ciphertext without changing the underlying plain text. And uh, with ASCTR, you can do it by changing the IV here, decrypting and re-encrypting with another IV. On ASXTS, this is not really possible. It would be cumbersome to do it. So, um, yeah, okay, okay. I don't want to go too much in the detail for the header, but basically the idea is that uh, every header of, uh, if I take one subheader of a volume, this one also contains the encryption key of the less secret volume before itself in the chain. And this is a, is a cool feature because that means that with a single password, ShuffleKick can automatically open all the less secret volumes. This is good for usability because that means you are asked only one password and then you can work uh, uh, in parallel on all this, uh, concurrently on all the less secret volumes. So implementation. Um, the way we implemented this is we split it into a user land tool and a kernel module. Uh, basically, the reason why we did this is that uh, working in user space, you can, first of all, leverage more advanced cryptography. For example, the argon function I mentioned uh, is not available in the um, kernel crypto library, but is available in user space libraries. And uh, it's also better for handling some errors. I don't know, you put, uh, you put a wrong password, you don't want a, a kernel log that says, oh, wrong password. You just want the user land tool that says, oh, you put the wrong password. Um, these two things also use uh, a virtual file system for communicating stuff. Now, when you put the password, the kernel module will provide the virtual block devices that correspond to the volumes that you're opening. And these block devices, you see them as a uh, uh, as external drives. So from a user point of view, you put a password and then it looks like you uh, plugged uh, a bunch of USB keys uh, into your laptop. And then you can do whatever you want with them. You can format them, you can mount them, you can write data, you can unmount them, just like a physical device. Just it's virtual. Uh, yeah, they appear under dev mapper and uh, yeah, you can do whatever you like with them. In practice, there is the way you use ShuffleKick, there is three main commands. There is also others, but these are the important one. ShuffleKick in it, it initializes a block device. The block device here is the, the, the physical, or it can also be virtual, but it's basically the partition that you want to uh, format for use. And when you do in it, uh, first thing uh, is it's overwritten with random data, and then the encrypted the header is formatted. You are asked how many layers you want. You are asked for a certain number of passwords according to this, and so on. Then shuffle cake open. You give the path of the block device, and you are asked one password. And when you put this password, the related volume and all the less secure volumes are automatically open. And finally, shuffle cake close. Um, you give the path of the block device, and everything is automatically um, uh, closed. So it remains invisible for the kernel. 
performance. So if we do benchmarks with this version of ShuffleKick, but we are about to release a big improvement, uh, we have roughly 30% uh, uh, slower performance than Lux uh, or TrueCrypt, uh, which is totally acceptable for daily use because Lux and TrueCrypt are very, very fast. You basically don't see them. And it has a negligible waste of space. As, as, uh, as you write data on the device, the amount of space that is taken by the fragmentation of slices uh, goes to zero. So it's um, basically you're not wasting any space at the end. Now, future directions. I mean, what I want to say is that this is, uh, sounds very cool, but it's still very experimental. You know, it's not ready for production. And um, as I said, this has become a, basically a hobby project, a pet project. Uh, we are still working on that, uh, and there is a few things that we have clear plans how to do and others that are research uh, in progress, so to say. Uh, well, the first thing to do is that uh, we would like to make it more, uh, let's say, easy for the... So right now, what you, if you want to try it, you have to download it from Codeberg, you have to make... Uh, I mean, you have to compile it. You have to manually load the kernel module that is not signed, so you get a bunch of warnings. And uh, you have to call uh, the, the, the user land tool. You have to manually mount the volumes. You have to manually format them. I mean, we want to automate a little bit these things, right? But the first thing to do is, for example, having a user-friendly installation procedure. Uh, also test other distribution, because for now we are doing our testing on Debian and Ubuntu. Um, we would like to redistribute the kernel module in a more, uh, you know, professional way instead of every time you have to download the kernel headers in order to recompile. Um, do some proper packetization and uh, improve the developer documentation. There is also some dreams that we have, but for this we will need some more time and maybe some external help. Right now this is all written in C. We would like to port it to Rust at some point. Uh, adding a graphical user interface like Veracrypt, for instance, and maybe at some point also port it to Windows iOS because that's, uh, I mean, a large use base still uses uh, uh, inferior operating systems. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and then there is work in progress more on the uh, research side because, uh, for example, right now, as it is now, uh, this is not crash consistent. What it means is that if your uh, laptop crashes while you are writing data on the disk, there is a concrete risk of um, uh, losing data. Because if the crash happens between the, uh, uh, when you are uh, writing encrypted data and writing the IV for decrypting, if a crash happens at the point when you reboot, uh, you have a ciphertext and an initialization vector that is not the right one. So you get undecryptable blocks of data on your laptop. Uh, what we want to achieve, so the reason why we want um, this feature of re-randomization of ciphertext is that we have plans uh, in the future to add uh, um, a way of shuffle cake working with uh, uh, multi-snapshot security, at least in a partial way. So, okay, back for a second to crash consistency. This is a problem that we know how to solve, okay? So uh, there are ways to solve it, we just have to implement it. Multi-snapshot security this is a bit of a research in progress because we know, because we have specific mathematical theorems, that if we want something multi-snapshot secure, we have to use ORAMs. But what we want to do is to achieve some intermediate security notions that provides uh, multi-snapshot security with a certain degree of uh, security and still has a negligible impact on the performance. And uh, we plan of using this feature of uh, re-randomization of uh, encryption uh, so that uh, when you have a bunch of volumes open, you can keep a daemon in the background that uh, re-randomizes blocks at random in the empty space. So to an adversary, this looks like there is always something more and uh, there is no way to tell when you have given the, the last password. Um, what we are about to release very soon is a version that is called Shuffle Cake Lite, um, uh, which basically gets rid of the randomization idea. Let's stick only to single snapshot security because, you know, we think it's good enough but it solves a bunch of problems. So first of all, it solves crash consistency. It gets rid of this 30% slowdown. It has 
and still keeps all the operational advantages of shuffle key. Corruption resistance, this is a nice feature. Well, I mean, it's not super important, but some people want it. Uh, the idea is that uh, if you are stopped at the border and the adversary says, open your lap, uh, give me your password, you give the decoy password, very good. But then the adversary, they are, they are assholes and they, would like, they, they start writing data on your decoy partition without the hidden partition being open. This has the risk of corrupting the, uh, the hidden partition because the adversary doesn't know, but they are um, overwriting data there. Now, 100% mitigation, it's impossible. It's impossible because you want that the system is uh, ignorant about uh, the data that is not unlocked. So there is no way to avoid this 100%. However, uh, mitigation must not be perfect. And in fact, we have, um, we already have a proof of concept, basically, uh, of using error correction codes in the hidden volumes. Uh, basically, you sacrifice some space, but you gain in resiliency with the hope that if the adversary doesn't corrupt uh, too many slices of the hidden volume, then when eventually, after 10 years, you are released from jail and you get back your laptop, uh, you can still put the real password and, uh, your uh, hidden volume will be recovered automatically without uh, you needing to restore from a backup, for example, which is the only option you have with ThrowCrypt right now. Uh, volume metadata, we have some space for embedding volume metadata in the hidden header. This is helpful, for example, if you want to automatically mount the, the volumes at some positions, because clearly for plausible deniability, you cannot put it in a FS tab you have to embed this information within the encrypted header. Reclaiming unused slices, uh, well, okay, I mean, this is actually not super important, but the idea is that uh, once a slice is assigned to a volume, that assignment is, is forever, even if the data is completely removed from there. It would be nice to have a garbage collection that reassigns the slides to the um, empty pool. Uh, hidden shuffle kick OS. Oh, this is important because all the stuff that I, all the cool features of shuffle kick that I just talked about, they are completely useless. They are completely useless because we know that the problem with these solutions is that uh, since this is an application that lives in the operating system, your operating system will leak the information of hidden partition. There is no way this is not going to happen. They are going to mess up. They are going to cache uh, uh, log information. They are going to cache uh, um, thumbnails of pictures that are in the hidden partition. Your adversary will find something. The only solution is to boot the operating system from within a hidden partition. This is secure. And this is the... Uh, the but the problem is that the only feature that we know of uh, that achieves this security is VeraCrypt and only for Windows. So VeraCrypt has this nice feature that can use a uh, minimal ad hoc bootloader and this bootloader decrypts the disk and boots uh, Windows from uh, there. The architecture that we have with the kernel module gives us some hope uh, that we can do something similar with Grub, for example, or even um, ad hoc bootloader and it would allow us to boot uh, different versions of Linux uh, from uh, uh, different volumes and achieve real plausible deniability. Uh, mobile, I mean, we haven't talked about mobile. All this stuff works on laptops, like devices that you have to switch off at some point. Uh, research ongoing on whether we can achieve something on mobile or not really. Uh, and then finally, this is my favorite topic actually, the anti-safe word. Um, I can go more in detail, I think we have some time for questions, but uh, basically the idea is that uh, right now ShuffleKick has a maximum of 15 volumes, which is enough for your use cases in the sense that if you need to remember more than 15 passphrases, then your threat model is really wrong. But uh, <laughs> there is technical reasons why it would be advisable to have an unbounded number of volumes uh, uh, limited to the space availability of the of the disk and uh, basically because if you if you have as long as you have a hard limit be it three drives three volumes uh, 15 uh, 30 100 volumes uh, the user can do something very dangerous for their security and uh, if you have a system that removes this bound 
you remove the possibility of the user to have, um, shooting them on the foot. Finally, uh, this is also a call to action. Please come and contribute because uh, it would be cool to have more contribution. Uh, right now we are on Codeberg because uh, GitHub sucks. No, it's not true, but I mean, uh, we prefer to stay on Codeberg. And uh, we have a Jabber channel, we have a Mastodon instance uh, and um, website or reach us by email and feel free to contribute. Thank you very much. So if any of you have questions, we have about another five minutes. Tommaso, thank you very, very much for your work. I think you're protecting journalists and people who have a legitimate interest to using these crypto cryptographic tools around the world. Um, and it's really something that plays to my heart. And thank you very thank much. Thank you. Doing so if our anyone best. has any questions, just raise up your hand. I'll come over with the microphone. Perfect. All righty. Thank you for the talk. Uh, the, the block devices that are created, the volumes, do they all look as if they would use the entire space? Okay, can you, sorry. Do, do the volumes look as if they would use the entire space of the disk? That's correct. Uh, so right now we use overcommitment, which means that uh, if you have a one gigabyte drive and you have three volumes, the system will see these three volumes as they are all one gigabyte in size. Now, if you, if you write more than one gigabyte across all of them, you start receiving uh, IO errors. But to an adversary, it's impossible to, to see that. So you can't now, really prove that the disk is full, even though it's not really full, right? That's correct. Okay. So the, the improvement that we have over this, uh, it's something nice, and it re it's related to the metadata. In fact, I have a slide here. Uh, one second. Use of volume metadata. So uh, mount point, uh, corruption status, ah, virtual quotas. So basically what you can do is to have a system of uh, virtual sides for the volumes which is embedded in the encrypted header but is not related to the volume but to the less secret volume. The idea would be, let's say you have three volumes, you only open one, you see this volume as large as the full disk. You open two, well, you see that the first volume was actually only 500 gigabytes and the second one is 500 gigabytes. You open three volumes, then you see 500, 200, and 300. So the last one always looks like it's taking the full space, but it actually helps to avoid the problems of overcommitment from the user and to uh, be more user friendly. Okay, so in the worst case, the, the uh, adversary would just fill up the volume entirely and then all your hidden volumes are gone, right? That's, that's true. But uh, in many circumstances, that's actually something you want. Oh, because, true. Uh, you know. Do you have any integrity protection for the volumes? Because CTR is, uh, ASCTR is not authenticated? No, because you don't want integrity protection. Okay. So we have integrity protection in the header for uh, basically checking that the password you are, it, it's basically an HMAC that it says that uh, the password is correct. But the data inside, you don't want to have integrity protection because otherwise, so okay, there is three reasons. First one, it wastes space. Uh, the second one, it uh, decreases performance. And the third one is that actually um, you don't want the system to be robust in the sense that if the adversary mess starts messing up with it and they do some mistake or they start changing, that's good for you. Because then uh, your defense can say, ah, look, uh, this proof was tampered by the, uh, by the forensic expert. If they want to plant some false flag on you, they can do regardless. Because when you give the, uh, the decoy password, the adversary can put some illegal material in the decoy and say, ah, you see? But uh, um, yeah, integrity protection is not in scope in this case. But very good question, because in general, you want integrity protection. Yes. Any questions from the back? Oh, here we go. Um, if if it has downsides, so if you usually want integrity protection, but in this case you don't have it, um, wouldn't it mean that it, simply using Shuffle Cake means that you have something to hide? Okay, this is a question that we have usually. So in general, uh, any of these plausible deniability solution, they don't, they are unable to hide their own existence. So yes, you are using one of these tools. Uh, it signals that you have something to hide. But notice the difference with TrueCrypt. In TrueCrypt, 
the adversary sees that you're using TrueCrypt, okay, you have something to hide, give me the decoy password and the hidden password. Here, they can, they don't know when to stop and questioning you, which is also bad because, it, I mean, they will not know how to stop torturing you, right? <laughs> But the reality is that uh, there is uh, many cases where uh, torture is not an option. For example, if you are uh, detained by the police, for example, they will not have a way to say that you have not fully complied with their request. And also, the most important thing to not forget is that uh, there is cases where the data that you are protecting, you care more than your own life. I mean, this can happen. There are heroes up there, right? And... Uh, uh, as I said, if you end up in the car, uh, if you are kidnapped by the cartel, you are dead. The thing that you can do is to try to resist and to not uh, give a list of your uh, collaborators, for example, and your uh, informators if you're a journalist. But with ShuffleKick, you have this choice. With TrueCrypt, you don't. So how about having this solution on a, a USB key, for example? Did you consider this maybe not to reveal the presence of the software you, on board? You mean with, uh, with Lux or with uh, ShuffleCake? No, so, ShuffleCake on a removable drive yes, so you can boot and... Uh, look, it, it is an option. It is an option. And in fact, we are also working... I mean, we would like to work on a, let's say, portable uh, version of ShuffleCake. The problem is that, uh, I mean, now you're doing something dangerous because you are relying your uh, threat model on the assumption that the adversary doesn't found this uh, suspicious dongle that you're hiding. But yes, it's, it's an additional layer of secrecy that might make sense, yes. Because the thing is, it could just reveal the presence of the software. I mean, it's just like, ah, okay, ah, you use the software, so it's something that you do anyway, so... That's true, that's true, yes. But in order to be really safe, I mean, basically there is two options here. Either you do it, as you say, like uh, in the USB drive, but ideally with some, uh, like, um, uh, privacy-preserving distro, like um, there was, there used to be Knoptix, huh? Tails, exactly, like you embedded in Tails. Or, I mean, the best solution, in my opinion, would my dream would arrive at some point where if the software becomes mature enough without uh, performance drawbacks, this is included by default uh, in the distribution instead of Lux, for example. At this point, everyone is using it uh, and uh, everyone is safer. Another question. Okay, so could it be an option to have uh, uh, the software That is actually interesting. Can we um, maybe move this conversation? Yes, let's take off. it offline. We, we need to move in the next speaker. But thank you so, so much. Thank you. <laughs>